I want to say um, this morning, um, I struggled to put my thoughts together this week to come around the table. Um, last week, uh, Keith ended by reading John 3.16, and I thought about it all week long, very familiar verse, we all can say it backwards. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Sometimes we just rhyme that right off. You know, if you have to quote a Bible verse for, um, you know, a sword drill or something, usually that's the one people quote because they know it. Well, 15 years ago today was a very special day. Um, it was uh, the day that God added Taylor to our family. And what I struggle with all week is thinking, God gave his son so that people would not perish. The other scripture that came to my mind when I was thinking about this was in Romans where it says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And what I struggled with all week long is thinking, would I give my son to die, to suffer, for people who don't care that he is dying and suffering for them? During, um, just while we are singing that song, I, I was actually uh, spying on uh, <coughs> Sullivan's there while uh, he was holding his Miles, and Miles was talking to him and laughing and that, and I'm like, that's a thing of beauty. Would he give his son for the vilest offender? You think of someone in our community who you think, there's no way that they'll ever come to Christ. Well, Jesus died for them. When we say, bring up the last slide there, Brandon. I was thinking, during that chorus, lest we forget Gethsemane, lest we forget thine agony. We think of Christ's agony. Think of God's agony when Jesus was on the cross, covered with all of our sin. God watched his son die, knowing that there he was dying for some people who didn't care. And he did it because we are his creation and he loves us. So when we meet around this table and we take a little wafer, we drink a little juice. There is an onus put on us who believe to be a light in our community. To be a light among our Christian friends. To be a light among people who don't believe the same with us. So as we partake, I'm going to ask Jamie to give thanks for the bread. And I want us to examine ourselves with the weight that if we were God, he suffered as he gave his son on our behalf so that we may have a relationship with him. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the gift of your son. And we know that there was a great price paid for our salvation, for us to, to have our sins removed. And Jesus, and you bore an awful lot to make that happen. We just pray that you will bless this bread. And as we partake, we remember how important it is. In Jesus' name, amen. In the night he met with his disciples, he took bread and he broke it. He said, take thee. This is my body, broken for you. The scripture today is from Exodus 18, 13 to 26. 
The next day Moses took a seat to serve as judge for the people, and they stood around him from morning till evening. When his father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, What is this you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge while all these people stand around you from morning till evening? Moses answered him, Because the people came to me to seek God's will. Whenever they have a dispute, it is brought to me, and I decided between the parties and informed them of God's decrees and laws. Decrees and laws. Moses' father-in-law replied, Moses' father-in-law replied, What you are doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Listen now to me, and I will give you some advice. And may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring your disputes to him. Teach them the decrees and laws and show them the way to live and the duties they are to perform. But select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds and fifties and tens. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times, but have them bring every difficult case to you, the simple cases they can decide themselves. That will make, you, make your load lighter, because they will share it with you. If you do this and God so commands, you will be able to stand the strain, and all of these people will come, will, will go home satisfied. Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. He chose capable men from all Israel and made them leaders of the people, officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. They served as judges for the people at all times. The difficult cases they brought to Moses, but the simple ones they decided themselves. One day, I'm going to be a father-in-law. And Exodus chapter 18, verse 24 will be my favorite verse. That Moses obeyed his father-in-law. And did everything that he told them to do. Can I get an amen from all the father-in-laws out there this morning? <laughs> yeah. Um, had a great uh, visit this last week to uh, PEI for the KT Norris Lectureships and had a good time with uh, Mark and uh, Jamie, uh, Richard, Alex. Uh, we, we shared a ride down there and back. So we talked a lot about church. We talked a lot about families. We talked a lot about wives. So I know a whole lot more about Diane and Jessica and, uh, and Lorraine. Uh, don't worry, Christy, I just, I listened. <laughs> it, was a, it was a good trip. Learned, learned, learned a lot and uh, had a lot of fun at the same time, so that was good. Um, I do have a few things I want to emphasize for you. Some of these were already uh, announced, but... I, I just want to emphasize for you that um, the men's group uh, at Mark's house on February 5th, the Super Bowl party, it'll be a fun time. Really want to encourage you guys to come to that. Um, I also want to emphasize our drama team um, meeting on also February 5th. It's just going to be just for a few minutes, right after our morning worship time uh, next Sunday. Uh, we just want to get together with anyone who's interested in doing some kind of a drama team. Uh, we don't know what it's going to look like yet. Uh, we don't know how all that's going to play out. But we just want, if you at all are interested in anything about uh, drama, skits, plays, if you can write it, but you not necessarily want to act, if you're a writer, not an actor, we'd love to have you, like Nancy said. Um, if you're someone that might be able to build sets and have somewhat of a creative, constructive mind that way, um, come. And uh, we just want to get as many of you together as we can and and uh, we want to see if there's uh, just another way to present God's word. And we always want to be about presenting God's word the most effective and best and uh, creative way that we can. And uh, so this is just another, another form of that. So we want to invite you to do that. Um, Jethro was a father-in-law. Now, I don't know about you, but... Sometimes I have a hard time listening to my father, especially when the first words out of his mouth is, Darren, 
I've got some advice for you. Now, I don't know about you. Am I the only one that has an in, that kind of the, you know, the hair on the back of the neck kind of stands up a little bit? Uh, you get defensive. I, I get it. I'm not going to say what you do. I get a little defensive, you know. Uh, I don't know if that's just me um, or if it's just human behavior. But again, when I read scriptures like we're reading this week in Exodus chapter 18, I put myself in Moses' shoes and I think, what if my father-in-law, his name's Bob, what if Bob were to come to me and say the things to me that Jethro said to Moses? I want to believe that I would respond the way that Moses did. Now, last week, we talked about how Moses responded to God at the burning bush. Now, I find this ironic. That it was God Moses decided to have an argument with. And his father-in-law was just like, yeah, dude, whatever you say, I'm all over it. <laughs> See, I don't understand that. See, with me, I think it'd be the other way. If God showed up burning bush that wasn't burning and God spoke to me, I'd be like, all right, man, I'm all about that. My father-in-law, I would say, but I'm not sure that I don't get what you're saying, you know, have all these excuses. So I think that probably what's occurred here over a period of time, Moses has learned a little humility. If you look through the account of the plagues, and how those events, we don't have time to look at all of that this morning. But I would encourage you to go back into Exodus chapters 3, 4, and 5, and 6, and 7. Between Exodus 3 and Exodus 18. And look at the process that Moses went through to, to get the people of Israel released. If you remember the first few plagues, the... Um, or the first two uh, signs that Moses showed Pharaoh, Pharaoh's own little advisors were able to imitate the staff and the snake, you know, that kind of thing. So I would encourage you to go back because Moses had to learn through that process. He had to learn some humility. And I think that between that event at the burning bush and where Moses was actually in a place where he could listen to advice, he was ready for it. He was ready for it. I can't believe the burden that he must have shared. Bible scholars said there could be anywhere between two to three million people that were being moved. Can you imagine that? How many people were in Nova Scotia? Like 900,000? How many people in New Brunswick? A million? Not many? Not, that, not even that many? What would you estimate? 800, about 800,000. So even between Nova Scotia, what about PEI? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, are there even 2 million people in the Maritimes? <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? That's a lot of people. Moses is burdened to get these people to move them from a place they'd known for over 300 years to just pack up and move everything they, they've ever known to a place where they don't have a clue. They don't even know where they're going. How difficult must that journey have been? What kind of a burden that must have been on Moses and on the things that he had to deal with? Now Moses, when they, when they cross the Red Sea and they're on the other side of the Red Sea, <laughs> And the Pharaoh's army's been consumed by the Red Sea. He can't chase them anymore. So there's some sense of safety because Pharaoh and his army can't get to them anymore. Pharaoh's gone. He, he, was, he, he, he died in the Red Sea along with the rest of his chariot army. So there was, a, there was some safety there. As soon as they crossed the Red Sea, they could breathe a little bit. And Moses made a decision. He sent his wife and his children to live with Jethro. To live with his father-in-law. Now, I think there are two reasons why Moses did that. One, he had a lot on his mind, just like we were talking about. Heavy burden to lead two to three million people. And I'm sure that his wife and kids were probably somewhat, he felt, somewhat of a distraction if he didn't have to have 
their needs to worry about. He could really focus on the burden that he had at hand. I believe the second reason was because the life on the trail was very difficult. It would have, can you even imagine how difficult it, they didn't have RVs back then. They didn't have conversion vans. They didn't ride in style, Richard, like we did up to PEI and back, right? Leather seats, nice car, big four-wheel pickup truck. We didn't care what the, what the weather was going to be. We were hoping it was going to snow. We wanted, a, we wanted an excuse, right? Open that four-wheel drive pickup heavy ton thing, whatever it was. Yeah. We wanted an excuse to drive that thing. They didn't have stuff like that. Moses knew this region very well. He spent almost 40 years as a shepherd all around the land of Midian and around the land of Mount Sinai. Moses knew this region very well. Moses knew that if he and a couple of guys with some backpacks were going to walk from where they were at the Red Sea to the Mount of Sinai, it would take them three days. Moses knew that. It took the people of Israel two months to go what a couple of guys with backpacks could have done in three days. Now, I don't know about you when I travel. I like to get from point A to point B. So does Jamie. I had to go to the bathroom a couple times. You should have heard the, the stuff I got from Jamie about having to stop. <laughs> Jamie likes to get from point A to point B. I like to get from point A to point B. I, like, I don't like a lot of waiting around in the middle of a trip. I think most guys are probably like that. I think Moses was probably like that. I think a lot of guys on that journey were probably like that. I can't imagine how frustrating it would have been to know we could get to where we're going in three days. And we're one month in. <laughs> Frustrating. So Moses sent his family, because that, that was a hard, hard, hard life. So I can understand, can't you, why Moses would want his family to go to Jethro, where a place where they were safe and could have some stability. Can you understand that? I think I may have made the same decision Moses did. But Jethro knew something better. And that's what we're going to spend some time talking about this morning. Jethro knew something better. That even though Moses had a responsibility to this great nation, and even though his burden to lead this nation was great, that his first responsibility was to his wife and to his children. That his first burden was not to the nation of Israel, but it was for his wife and his children. Because Jethro brought his wife and kids back. Moses sent them, and Jethro brought them right back. Now, I don't think that it was because Jethro's daughter and her two boys were problems. I don't think it, that's why Jethro wanted to get them out of the house. I really believe that Jethro wanted to bring Moses' wife and kids back to Moses because Moses had a responsibility as the husband and as the father in that family to lead that family. And so what we learn from Exodus chapter 18 verse 5 first is that God expects us as moms and dads to disciple our family first. That is our first priority. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, it says, Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the Lord alone. And you must Lord, uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And you must commit yourself wholeheartedly to these commands. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home. Talk about what? This. Talk about this. Talk about it with your children. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your mind. What does that mean? Talk about it to your kids at home. Talk about it. When you're on the road, talk about it. Talk about what? Talk about what it means to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. What it means to be committed to this 
to this law of the Lord, to love him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. What does that mean? Talk about it. Talk about it at home. Talk about it on the road. To who? To your children. Talk about it when you're going to bed. Talk about it when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands. See, this is scriptural. If you ever see my kids with their hands tied, <laughs> tie them to your hands. Wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorpost of your house and on your. What, what's the point? The point is that should be the thing all the time that is motivating your family to do everything that it does. That's the point. That loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, it is not the preacher's responsibility to lead that in your life. It is not the elder's responsibility to lead that in your life. It is not anybody else's responsibility to lead that truth in your life. If you're a mom and a dad, it is God's design for you to lead that motivation and that culture of loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. It is mandated by God that mom and dads, you are to disciple your family first. In Matthew 28, 19 and 20, Jesus said this, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. And be sure of this, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. That is a directive from Jesus himself. Go into all the world, make disciples. Teach them to obey all the commands that I've given you. Well, if we're going to partner that with Deuteronomy chapter 6, wouldn't it make sense, mom and dads, that the first ones we would want to disciple would be our own children? In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, it says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. I struggle with that sometimes. Do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. It doesn't say the Sunday school teacher to bring them up. It doesn't say the youth minister to bring them up. It doesn't say the preacher is supposed to bring them up. Or anyone else is supposed to bring them up. It says fathers, bring them up. Uh, man, the scriptures are clear as day, man. We need to get in tune with God's word as modern families that God expects us as mom and dads. I, I'm just going to say this real quickly because in our culture, in our world, and this is just the reality, not every family has a mom and dad. Some families today just have moms. And some families today just have dads. There are a lot of children who don't have a mom or a dad. More and more of our children with every passing generation are being raised by a grandma or grandparents or the state or the province. Now that's not necessarily how God designed it. But it's the reality of the world we live in. Yes? I want to tell you, my heart goes out to single moms. I have a burden for single moms. Christy and I both have a burden for, we, we pray for single moms. One of the things that we are most excited about what this church is doing is the play group on Tuesday, uh, Tuesday mornings. I was told that there are a lot of single moms who bring their children to that play group. And I think that is great. You know why? Because they need support. I can't even begin to imagine how difficult it would be to be a single mom. That blows my mind. The burden on, on a single mom to raise her children. Wow. 
Anything that we can do as a church to come alongside those moms to help them with this, we need to do. We need to do everything we can to be a blessing to those single moms. It would be difficult. That's just a caveat I wanted to bring up while I was talking about this. The second lesson that Jethro talks about, the advice that he gives to Moses. The first thing he does, not only does he give, the first thing he does is he brings Moses' wife and kids back. The second thing he does is he leads Israel to do a celebration. He leads them to do a feast in chapter 18, verses 10 to 12. And I can't even believe, begin to imagine what this celebration would have looked like. I mean, can you imagine being rescued from slavery where you and your ancestors have spent three, four hundred years or so in bondage to a country like Egypt? In the last hundred years, they've been brutally subordinated. Brutally so. And now, for the first time, these people are free. They don't have somebody walking around with a whip getting them to make bricks or stone and to put them on their pyramids or whatever else they were building in Egypt. For the first time, they were free. They didn't have anyone telling them what to do. They could look around and go, wow, nobody's here to force me to do something. I can't believe how free they felt, how incredibly joyous they felt at being free from that oppression. So that celebration must have just been huge and awesome. And we're told in the scripture that they ate a feast like we're going to eat on next Sunday. The guys are anyway. I don't know what the girls are going to do. What are the girls going to do? You guys are going to sleep. <laughs> Party. But Jethro concludes here. This is what Jethro concludes. I know, Jethro says, that God is greater than any other gods. He's greater than anything else anybody, on else, uh, anybody else in, on the earth worships. This God is greater than any other God. Jethro preached to them. You know why he said that? Jethro said the evidence is in your deliverance. The evidence, Je uh, Jethro said, is your deliverance is the evidence of this incredible and awesome God. We have the same testimony today. Now, we weren't, we weren't saved from physical slavery in Egypt, but the Bible teaches that we were freed from our slavery to sin. That Jesus Christ delivered us. The same God that rescued the people from Egypt is the same God who rescued us from our sinful nature. Who, as Mark said this morning, put his own son on the cross to be sin for us so that we could walk as free people, free from sin. And I'm wondering, what kind of a celebration do we have in our life? Does it compare to the celebration that they had in Exodus 18, that they experienced under Jethro's guidance? How do we celebrate? How do you celebrate today the deliverance that you have experienced from sin? The fact that you know without any doubt that you can spend your eternity with God through the sacrifice that Jesus made for you. How do you celebrate that? In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 and 25, it says, Let us hold tight without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. In Colossians 3.16 it says, Let the message about Christ, what message? That he freed us from sin? 
Let that message in all of its riches fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. And sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And in the King James Version it says, Rock out to God with thankful hearts. Party! It's a celebration, man! In 1 Thessalonians 5.11 it says, Encourage and build each other up. Just as you are doing. In other words, keep doing that. In Titus chapter 2, verses 2 to 4, Paul says this to, to Titus, a, a young preacher. He says, teach, teach the older men to exercise self-control. Teach them to be worthy of respect and to live wisely. They must have a sound faith. They must be filled with love and patience. Similarly, teach the older women to live in a way that honors God. They must not slander others or be heavy drinkers. Instead, they should teach others what is good. These older women must train the younger women to love their husbands and their children. The Bible teaches that we are to be living lives in such a way that we teach and exemplify the nature of Christ. That we must live the way he lived. And it's the burden on those of us who are older, who have experienced life as Jethro, to go to the younger and teach and counsel how to live this way. And then it is the burden on the younger, I'm just going to throw myself in that crowd, if you don't mind, to listen, to heed to the counsel of the wiser and the older. Now that's in Scripture. That's in the Bible. But that's a ministry of teaching. And my question is, is that happening in your life? If you're an older person, are you teaching a younger person? Are you showing with your life, with the example of your life, the spirit of Christ that lives in you? Are you teaching a younger person? It's not about... Sending people to Sunday school. It's not about sending people to went to a youth group on Wednesday night. I mean, those things are fine. I'm not saying those things are not. But if that's the culmination of all of our teaching experience as a church, we are falling way below the standard that's biblical. Because what's biblical is every single in this room knows someone younger than you. And the biblical mandate is that if you're a parent first, you're going to reach your children first. And then you're going to develop a relationship with someone younger than you that you can mentor and show and teach a life in Christ. That's what the Bible says. Is that happening in your life? And then the third thing that Jethro teaches Moses is found in chapter 18, verses 11 to 18. Jethro advises Moses basically to share his ministry with other capable people. To share his ministry with other capable people. Sometimes, and we talked about this in our Sunday school class this morning, Sometimes I think that we may as a church have a skewed definition of what it means, what, minister, what the word ministry means, or what it means to be involved in a church. Now, I don't know if this is the right definition. Maybe it's not. But it's one that, has, that, that I have defined as what ministry is. And if it doesn't make sense to you, you can come up to me and talk about it later, and that's fine. But here's what I think ministry is, defined as, as what I see Bible defining it as. It's something that you do as a follower of Christ 
that involves other followers of Christ that increases and matures God's church. That's it. That doesn't mean that it has to be started from the church. That doesn't mean that it has to be run by the church. That doesn't mean that it needs to be funded by the church. All the ministry is, simply put, is something that you're doing in your life that helps to increase and grow the church, to increase and grow God's people. And you're involving others in it. That's a ministry. Now, how did I come to that definition? Well, there's some scriptures. And we're going to close with a few. First, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 16. These are the gifts, the Bible says, that Christ gave to the church. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 16. Apostles, a prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And this is just a real quick summation that Paul's giving here. Their responsibility, these apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, their responsibility, according to Ephesians, is to equip God's people to do his work, to build up the church, the body of Christ. I'm a preacher. According to Ephesians chapter 4, my job is to equip you to go do God's work. It's not to do God's work so you don't have to. It's not to make visits so you don't have to. It's not to lead worship so you don't have to. It's not to teach so you don't have to. It's not to share Jesus with someone else so you don't have to. That's not my job. My job is to equip you to do that work. My job is to partner with other people in our church, who are leaders, who must be doing the same thing. Not doing the work for the church, but equipping the church to do the work. <coughs> equipping the church to do ministry. This will continue, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son, we will be mature in the Lord. There's the definition of what it means to be mature. It's right there. Measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature like children, Paul continues to say. When will we, be, when will we no longer be immature like kids? When we are all equipped as a church to build up God's work. Until then, Paul says, we won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We won't be influenced when people try to trick us with lies. Sometimes they're so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love. Just one person? No. We. Who's we? The church. We as a church. When we are mature. We as a church, when we are mature, will speak the truth in love. We will grow in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part, and that's you, and that's me, does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy, growing, and full of love. That's just Bible, people. It's just in the scripture. It's just it's what it says. Here's what 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 to 27 says. I'm not going to read all of it. But Paul basically makes an analogy of the church to a human body. He says your human body is made up of what? Hands, feet, a head, different part, body parts. Well, Paul says, if somebody in the church decides they don't want to fill their part, they don't want to do their part, it's like a hand telling the foot it doesn't want to do what it's designed to do. And Paul says, what would your body look like if your hand was doing the job of your foot? That's what he says. Read it for yourself. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 to 27. I like to think of it this way. I got a plate of food. On, I'm getting ready to eat. 
It's an awesome steak. Let me tell you something. The best steak I've had in the Maritimes is at Jamie's house, his parents' house. His mom makes a killer prime rib steak. I think all of you guys should go to their house in PEI <laughs> and eat a prime rib steak. Only if Jamie. Well, you got to take Jamie. Yeah. She won't. She probably won't do it unless Jamie's with. I I, I hear that Jamie's the special, the special one. <laughs> His mom will do anything for Jamie. So if Jamie calls and says, "Hey, mom, would you make prime rib steak for everybody that goes to Weymouth Church of Christ?" She'd do it for Jamie. But let's say I have a plate of food on the table in front of me. That awesome, juicy prime rib steak is just right there. And there's my fork. And there's my steak knife. And I'm getting ready to dig in. And I can't get my hand to grab the fork. And my brain says to my hand, pick up the dumb fork. And my hand says no. Because I'm too busy. I'm sorry. I'm fiddling with my keys. What do you mean you're fiddling with your keys? There's a prime rib steak right there. I'm hungry. I want to eat. Get your, out of my pocket. Pick up that fork. Because I'm hungry. No. I'm tired of being the hand. I've been the hand for 20 years. Get some other body part to do it. But I don't have another body part. You're the, you're the hand. So then my hand says to the other hand, you do it. Nope. Don't put me in charge of anything. Now what am I supposed to do? So then I say, okay, well, nobody wants to do it, so I'm going to put a sign-up list next to my plate. <laughs> if I can find a pen, I'm going to ask somebody in my body somewhere, sign up on that list so that I can start eating my steak. And I sit there, five minutes, no response. Ten minutes, there's not one body part that's put their name on that list. My steak's getting cold. And so I say, well, isn't this a fine how you do? This body can't even find a hand to cut a steak so I can eat. Somebody ought to feel guilty about that. And so finally, my foot says, well, if nobody else is going to do it, I guess I will. <laughs> Great. So now it's going to be my foot trying to pick up a fork and cut a piece of meat to feed my mouth. Is that going to go very well, I ask you? That's how the church is functioning. That's how we're functioning right now. The whole world is hungry for the word of God. It's on the plate. It's ready to serve. And we've got body parts who are not willing to work in the part that they've been created and gifted. Why? Because they want to stay in the pocket fiddling with keys. I don't know, but they have an excuse. And they want some other body part to do what it is they've been designed and gifted to do. And I'm telling you guys, as ridiculous as that analogy I just gave to you, that's what the church is looking like to God right now. Ridiculous. We need to understand what the Word of God says. Amen? Amen. You have been gifted with a gift to serve in the church. You have a part to fill. You do. I do. And you do. And until every single one of us who calls Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior is invested in the work that he's called us to do. And we are filling the part in this body that we have been designed to fill. We are creating disability in this body.
And my question to you is, wake up, please, and discover the part that you are to fill. Because it's not what's good for me. It's not what's good for you. It's what's good for the body of Christ and for the work of God on the earth. Let's pray. God, there are so many truths in your scripture. It's impossible for us in 30 or 40 minutes to discover them all. But those nuggets of truth that we receive, like the truth today, just as Jethro advised Moses so many thousands of years ago to disciple his family first, to celebrate you and the work that you're doing, and to share his ministry with other people, we are called to the same advice this morning. And my prayer, God, is that we will listen to your voice. We will discover the place and the part that we are to fill for, for your kingdom work that's taking place right now in this community. You are awesome, God. Thank you so much for even the privilege of being able to serve you. Because I know I don't deserve it. But thank you, God, for the privilege to serve you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.